Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're joined by Dr. Lauren Weiss. She is an astronomer at the University of Hawaii. We will be talking about her work discovering the TOI 561 planetary system and discussing extreme exoplanets. First, we're going to head out to the Trappist-1 solar system, where we find each of the seven worlds in that family of planets are surprisingly alike. Next, we look at a new study finding that earlier reports of phosphine on Venus may have been an error. Then, we look at a new conceptual idea for a next-generation plasma engine that could bring spacecraft and people to Mars and beyond. Roughly 40 light-years from Earth, the TRAPPIST-1 system contains at least seven planets. A new study shows these worlds have nearly identical densities, a little lower than Earth. This suggests the worlds might be rocky planets, possibly containing iron oxide or rust running through their bodies. Another intriguing possibility is that at least three of these planets might be water worlds, with oceans far larger than those found on Earth. The TRAPPIST-1 system is one of the most likely places where we might one day discover alien life. Join us next week on this show when we'll be talking with Dr. Eric Agall from the University of Washington, one of the leaders on this study. In September 2020, a group of astronomers reported finding phosphine, a chemical normally associated with life, in the clouds of Venus. Now, a new examination of that finding shows this report may have been in error. This new study suggests sulfur dioxide, a chemical that makes up the smell of burnt matches, may have been responsible for the earlier finding, dashing hopes for finding evidence of primitive life in the clouds of our planetary neighbor. Plasma engines are already being designed for spaceflight, but they provide very little thrust. A new design envisioned by Fatima Abrahimi from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory promises to deliver far more thrust than today's plasma engines. This new engine design takes advantage of magnetic reconnection, a process seen on the Sun in which energy is released by the breaking and the reconnection of magnetic field lines. This new design, once constructed, might deliver a tunable engine producing ten times as much thrust as current designs. Such an engine would allow spacecraft and people to travel to Mars, or other targets in significantly less time than today's designs. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today, we're joined by Dr. Lauren Weiss, astronomer at the University of Hawaii. 
She recently discovered a system of intriguing planets in the TOI 561 star system, including an extreme world of molten lava. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we bid a hearty aloha to Dr. Lauren Weiss. She is an astronomer at the University of Hawaii. She's made some interesting finds about an exoplanet system called TOI 561. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So you just tell us, give us a little bit of a brief intro, you know, tests, you know, the satellite space telescope test picked up something interesting around uh, this star, uh, which became known as TOI 561. Just a little bit about what's so interesting about this, about this star and this system. Right. So the uh, test mission is a, a small spacecraft uh, launched by MIT and NASA, and its goal is to search the whole sky for planets around nearby stars. And the way TESS finds those planets is it's looking for small changes in the brightness of the stars. And those brightness changes come about when a planet crosses or transits between the star and the space telescope and blocks just a very tiny fraction of the starlight. So TOI 561, TOI stands for Test Object of Interest um, because this particular star was uh, identified as having some of these transit-like features. So my team uh, was interested in the system because one of those transit-like features corresponded to a, a planet small enough that we thought it could be rocky um, and then there were two other uh, possible planets as well identified from these transits. So what we did um, is we're, we're part of what's called the TESS Keck survey. Um, so I'm, I'm one of the leaders of that survey. And what we do is we use um, telescopes on the ground and in particular the Keck telescope um, on Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Uh, we use that telescope to measure the motions of stars. And the reason this is important is we wanna figure out if those transit-like events that TESS is discovering are really from planets, and if so, what are the masses of those planets? Mm. So that's what we are detecting. Um, so in the TOI 561 system, we were really excited because one of the planets is very small, only about one and a half times the radius of the Earth based on the amount of starlight that it blocks during its transits. So we wanted to know if this was a, a rocky planet and we followed it up with the Keck Observatory. And um, in our paper, we were able to report that yes, it is a rocky planet, uh, which is great news. Um, the planet though has an orbital period of less than half a day. So what that means is it, it actually has a surface temperature of probably about 2,500 Kelvin plus, so that's you know, Fahrenheit, Celsius, whatever, it's thousands of degrees. Mm -hmm. um, it's hot. So it's, it's, hot. <laughs> it's, hot. it's hot enough to vaporize rock. So uh, <laughs> it's not, not at all a hospitable planet. Um, that's not what we were looking for in this particular system. Um, but we, we actually had a rather unexpected and exciting discovery. So you know, we were just interested because we thought, oh, there's a rocky planet, there's multiple planets, how nice. Um, but the exciting thing turns out to be the star itself. So most stars in our galaxy are part of what we call the, um, the thin disk of the galaxy. But our galaxy also has a thick disk, which is a, a population of stars that, that's much rarer than stars in the thick disk or in the thin disk. And these stars in the, in the thick disk have chemically distinct compositions from the stars in the thin disk. So with the Keck Observatory, not only did we measure the motion of the star, but we also were able to sample its, its chemistry based on um, 
based on what kind of starlight we get. Um, we actually look for um, little, little um, changes in brightness of the star as a function of wavelength. And those are caused by different atomic species in the, um, in the outermost layer of the star. So this, the star TOI 561 is very poor in its iron content. Um, but it's rich, well, relatively rich compared to iron in its, um, its content of other metals. And the reason that's important is that stars um, in the early universe formed be with whatever materials were available at the time. And in the early universe, there was a higher abundance of other metals compared to iron. But since then, Iron has been manufactured in the hearts of more and more stars. And so now there's just sort of more iron to go around in the universe. So based on the chemistry of this star, we were able to identify it as part of this galactic thick disk population, which actually makes this planet the, um, the first confirmed rocky planet around a star in our galaxy's thick disk. Wow. So that, that makes it part of a very special population that you know, as we find more planets and around Milky Way, thick disk stars, that, that'll help us understand um, sort of what are the rules of planet formation and how does planet formation depend on star chemistry and its galactic history. Um, but the other sort of the other fun thing is that we were able to to get a measurement of the age of the star. So it's 10 billion years old. Um, which, you know, for perspective, Earth is four and a half billion years old. The universe is 14 billion years old. Our Milky Way galaxy is about 12 billion years old. You know, so this star, TOI 561, at an age of 10 billion years, is almost as old as the Milky Way galaxy. Wow. It, um, you know, it was forming actually at the time that mo most of the stars in the galaxy were forming. Our, our galaxy was going through like this sort of growth spurt of, of forming all of these stars at that time. So it would have been a very special time to be around in the galaxy, which is cool. Um, it was sort of from the, you know, a perspective that we all care about, which is, well, okay, what does that say about, about life, the origins of life, mm -hmm. right? If the universe has been making rocky planets, for the past 10 billion years, that's a really good sign that there might be life elsewhere, you know, in the universe, elsewhere in our in our own galaxy, um, right? And, and the reason that this, you know, sort of wasn't expected maybe is um, is old stars, which are iron poor, don't have quite the same materials, the same building blocks to assemble planets as what we have here in the solar system. So for a long time, it was sort of an open question. Okay, can stars that are different from our sun, can they make rocky planets? Yes or no. And we've been discovering more and more that you know, different kinds of stars all seem to be pretty good at forming rocky planets. But this, this is the first, you know, the first galactic thick disk star and also the first 10 billion year old star with a confirmed rocky planet. So now we, now we really know rocky planets have been around for 10 billion years, even though this one's too hot for life. Um, it's, you know, it's a sign that the universe has been making rocky planets for a long time. Right, right. It's, it's, the, it's just mind boggling to think about, you know, how long this is going on. You know, if you think about how long life went on on earth for, you know, billions of years before um, the autotropes began to drool as, you know, the Big Bang Theory song says, uh, <laughs> you know, just how much life could be out there. But before we, you know, we're going to come back to that, but I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, you mentioned the chemistry of the star being so different, being so poor in metals, which of course we mean anything heavier than helium. Um, but how does that, how does that composition affect, uh, exoplanets? That is a great question. Um, and one for which we're still working on the answer. So actually one sort of interesting thing about this, um, about these planets is that the rocky planet, TOI 561b, um, 
it actually it's dense it, it, it's consistent with having a rocky composition but its density is a little bit lower than what we would expect for a, an exact earth-like composition so the earth is about 30 percent iron and the rest is other rocks, what we call like silicates. So things like silicon, oxygen, magnesium are, are sort of the elemental ingredients of those rocks. Um, so lower density means less iron because iron is more dense than like oxygen, silicon, magnesium, et cetera. So what this suggests is maybe this planet that we found is, is actually iron poor compared to the earth which is exciting because of course, I just told you all about how the star is iron poor compared to the sun. Right. So, you know, that's that's definitely a possibility that's on our mind. Um, but right now the the problem is our measurement isn't, isn't really good enough to say that conclusively. Um, so my, my team um, through my, actually through my PhD student is working on solving that problem. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the telescope and keep measuring the mass of the planet to get a more precise mass measurement. Because um, the way that we're inferring the composition of this planet is we know its radius from when it transits the star. And we know its mass because we've, we've gone to the telescope and measured how the star is moving due to the gravitational influence of the planet. So that between those two things, we can calculate the planet density and that's cool because planet density is related to what materials the planet is made out of. So if you put all this together, you what, what my student is doing is she actually makes models, like little geophysical models, where she layers up the materials inside the planet to see if she can reproduce the observed planet radius and mass and, and density. Um, but the problem is our uncertainty in the mass right now allows for a lot of different solutions. So if we can get a better mass measurement, that will help us answer what kind of interior composition is really possible for this planet. Hmm. And it would seem that if you have a planet that is that close to its star, it must be experiencing you know, huge amounts of radiation from stellar storms and um, that quite, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and if, yeah. And if it had an iron rich, uh, iron poor composition, that would seem to suggest a lack of an iron core, which in turn would seem to suggest a lack of a magnetic field, which would normally protect it from this radiation. Because that, how do you see life meeting those challenges where it ever form on there, on that world? Right, well, I mean, as I've said, this world is, is way too hot to support yeah. life. Um, in the past, it might have had an orbit further from the star than where it currently is, but that's that's not very well constrained by observations, right? So, um, you know, you can sort of imagine a variety of possible histories for the orbit of this planet, some of which might be consistent with you know, nice temperatures where we would like to live. Um, but it's, you know, we don't get to rewind the clock of the universe to go check out whether or not it was actually there. All we can do is measure all the orbital and physical properties as well as we can right now and check whether any idea we have about the history of the system fits with those current observations. Um, as for stuff like the magnetic field, yeah, that's, that's all super interesting. Um, we don't yet know how to measure things like do rocky planets have magnetic fields. Um, people are just beginning to detect what might be magnetic fields on the most massive planets, giant planets, almost brown dwarf mass planets, about, about 10 times the mass of Jupiter. So people are just starting to look at magnetic fields around those objects um you know so it's, you know maybe it's possible that in the next like 10 or 20 years maybe we'll come up with some clever way to extend that technique to smaller planets but um i don't yet know how to do that um but you're absolutely right that um 
you know, whatever, whatever the interior of this planet is like is going to have major implications for its geology, its magnetic history, and all of those things, as you mentioned, are so important to whether life can arise. So, you know, this, it's a great case for why we, you know, we're, we're not just sort of like, you know, looking for, you know, like just the one, you know, biosignature or whatever on planets. I mean, we definitely want to look for biosignatures, but a planet is so much more than just whether it has oxygen in its atmosphere. It's, it's this whole, um, it's a world, right? We want to know all about it. We want to know, does it have rocky surfaces? Does it have oceans, which are great for regulating the carbon cycle? Does it have a magnetic field? Does it have oxygen, right? So these these things together form a, a more complete portrait of what a planet is like and just give us a lot more leverage to understand whether or not it could be habitable. Right. And so what future, just to finish up, what sort of future studies would you like to see done on this system as well as other ones to help learn more about exoplanets? Um, we just, we need more measurements of all kinds. Um, and I, you know, I think we should be smart about what kind of questions we ask. You know, like you were saying, it, you know, it's it's time to start thinking about things like: Do planets have magnetic fields? Do do they have you know interesting surface geology like plate tectonics? Um, you know, I think those are questions that we're going to see people asking in the next sort of like 20, 30 years, and maybe actually answering. Um, in the meantime. Man, we just we're discovering so many planets, but we when we discover them, we only know like maybe one thing about them, like their orbital period or their you know their radius or whatever. And just just go going and characterizing those planets, making additional measurements of anything we can. You know, what's their mass? What's their orbital inclination? Any anything we can measure at this point is is really helpful in understanding how other worlds form and whether they could potentially evolve something interesting like life. That's fabulous. It was, it was great talking with you, Lauren. It's Thank great you having so you on much. The show. Thank you. And that was Dr. Lauren Weiss, astronomer at the University of Hawaii. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, when we'll be talking with Professor Eric Agall of the University of Washington. He is an astrophysicist focused on the study of exoplanets, and we'll be talking about his work uncovering conditions on the seven worlds of the TRAPPIST-1 system. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We also depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Mm-hmm.